Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. You're listening to episode 175 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about Noah's Ark and the Great Flood. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, be sure to stick around for the end of the episode, as we'll have your feedback on our recent episode on the Border Patrol Ghost. But first, in Genesis, God determined that he will wipe out humankind because of its great sinfulness, and he sends the Great Flood. But he preserves a remnant of humans to start the world anew. He also tells Noah to build an ark and take breeding pairs of all the animals. After the flood, he blesses man and the animals and gives the rainbow as a sign he will never again destroy the world by flood. But the flood account is a subject of controversy. People ask questions like, was Noah a real person? Was there really a worldwide flood? And how should we understand this biblical text? Well, that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, what do we need to say first to begin? Well, uh, first of all, this is a patron request episode. Andrew Kirk is one of our patrons and is giving at the level that would let him pick an episode of Mysterious World Topic, and he wanted to hear about the Great Flood. It took me a while to research this one because the evidence is rather complex, um, and I didn't want to shortchange it. We're actually going to be doing a two-parter. Uh, this time, in this week's episode, we're going to be looking at the flood principally from the faith perspective, and then in next week's episode, we'll look at the scientific evidence from the reason perspective. So in a way, Andrew's getting two episodes for the price of one. Excellent. So what background do we need to begin on the Great Flood? A little bit, but first, uh, we often talk about personal connections we have with the story, and I understand (laughs) that at time of recording, you have a personal connection with this topic. What is that, Dom? Uh, Well, yes, I didn't live through Noah's Great Flood, but I have had my own Great Flood here in my home. uh, If if you're watching the video, you'll see uh, my office is kind of stacked full of my family's valuables and possessions. Uh, We had a plumbing problem that has devastated a big chunk of my home, and so my family is living in temporary housing. And uh, so (laughs) there was a a great flood in the Bettinelli household. (laughs) Okay. Well, I'm sure y'all will come through it just fine. We will. Um, In terms of background for this episode, many people in the audience will likely have read the flood narrative in Genesis, and some of them will have read it multiple times. Even if they haven't, though, they'll know the basic structure of the story, which you covered in today's introduction. As a result, we won't be reading the full flood narrative. Uh, We'll only give you the relevant bits as we explore the mystery. But if you've never read it, or if you'd like to refresh your memory, you'll find it in Genesis chapters 6 to 9. And if you don't have a Bible at home, they're easily available online. Just go to uh, Bible Gateway or uh, Bible Hub, and you can read it right there online for free. Also, people may want to go back and listen to some of our prior episodes for additional background. For example, they might want to listen to episodes 119, 120, and 121, where we discussed whether or not we're living on a young earth. Uh, These episodes deal with some of the principles that need to be used when reading texts that are found in early Genesis. They also discuss creation science and the ideas that many creation scientists have proposed about the Great Flood. People also might want to go back and listen to episode 87 on the Nephilim. The Nephilim are a mysterious group uh, mentioned in the beginning of Genesis 6, who appear to be born when the sons of God marry the daughters of men, and the resulting children are giants, which is what Nephilim means in Aramaic. Despite what you may have heard, it does not mean fallen ones, that it would break the rules of Hebrew grammar here. It's Aramaic for giants. As you'll hear in this episode, the standard understanding 
during the Old Testament period and the Second Temple period when Jesus lived, appears to have been that the sons of God were angelic beings, uh, who were in fact fallen angels, even though that's not what the word Nephilim means. It doesn't mean fallen ones. These fallen angels taught mankind a bunch of things, including magical, occult practices, weapon-making skills, and various arts to aid in seduction. Uh, in much of the literature of the period, this is the cause of the human sinfulness that brings on the Great Flood. It's the fallen angels who corrupted mankind, so God wipes the slate clean and starts over. Because all this background is already out there, both in Genesis 6-9 to and in our prior episodes, we won't repeat it all here, so we'll get straight to the theories that we need to consider from the faith and reason perspectives. Well, before we get to the theories, I do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Lee N., Francesco M., JP, Andrea M., and Eric A. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. And by Fearvento Law, PLLC, specializing in adult guardianships and conservatorships, probate, and estate planning matters. Accepting clients throughout Michigan, taking into account your individual health care, financial, and religious needs. Visit fearventolaw.com. F I O R V E N T O law.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about the Great Flood? From the faith perspective, we need to consider a number of things, but they all fall under the general heading of what does the text of Genesis require us to hold? Some of the specific things that we need to look at include whether the faith requires us to read the flood narrative fully literally, uh, hold that there was a worldwide flood, hold that Noah, Noah was a historical person, or hold that rainbows did not appear before the flood. We also need to look at these issues from the reason perspective and see what light reason can shed on them. And that's what we'll, we'll be doing next week. This week we'll be covering them from the faith perspective. Why do you want to cover the faith perspective first? This is the same thing we did in our episodes on the young earth theory. Uh, the faith is divinely revealed by God, and thus it's guaranteed to be true. So if we can answer the questions definitively from the faith perspective, that would give us answers that are guaranteed to be true, and we wouldn't then need to look at the reason-based scientific arguments. On the other hand, if we can't give definitive answers from the faith perspective, that tells us we'll need to turn to reason next time and see what the science says. Okay. What can we say about Noah's Ark and the Great Flood from the faith perspective? So, like, what has the Church said about how this part of Genesis is to be interpreted? There's a marked shift in the writing style between the first 11 chapters of Genesis and the remaining one. The remaining ones. Scholars of all persuasions have recognized this, uh, Jewish and Christian, Catholic and Protestant, liberal and conservative, believing and skeptical. All scholars recognize, the competent ones, that there is a change in the style of writing. And the Catholic Church has addressed this fact. In 1950, Pope Pius XII wrote an encyclical called Humanae Generis, in which he said, The first 11 chapters of Genesis, although properly speaking not conforming to the historical method used by the best Greek and Latin writers or by competent authors of our time, do nevertheless pertain to history in a true sense, which, however, must be further studied and determined by exegetes. The same chapters, in simple and metaphorical language adapted to the mentality of a people, but little cultured, both state the principal truths which are fundamental for our salvation and also give a popular description of the origin of the human race and the chosen people. If, however, the ancient sacred writers have taken anything from popular narrations, and this may be conceded, it must never be forgotten that they did so with the help of divine inspiration, 
through which they were rendered immune from any error in selecting and evaluating those documents. So, as Pius XII acknowledges, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are not written according to later historical conventions, like the ones we use today. Instead, they use, in his words, simple and metaphorical language. Nevertheless, they pertain to history in a true sense. However, this sense needs to be further studied by exegetes to figure out how this form of writing works. Also, the biblical author may have taken material from popular extra-biblical narrations, and he mentions that because scholars have found other ancient Near Eastern flood narratives that are earlier than the one in Genesis and may have influenced it, uh, like the Babylonian Atrahasis epic, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and the Sumerian flood narrative. But, Pope Pius says, whatever material the author of Genesis may have taken from such narratives, he did so under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which renders what he ends up saying immune from error. Does that mean that the texts need to be understood fully literally? No, Pope Pius has already said that these chapters contain metaphorical language. That means they should not be taken fully literally. Instead, the goal is to figure out how much of them are non-literal, and then figure out what the author is ultimately trying to teach. It's what he's ultimately trying to teach that is guaranteed to be true and immune from error, not what you might suppose if you took him in a woodenly literal fashion. Can you give a parallel example from elsewhere in the Bible to make that concept clearer? Sure, let's talk about Jesus' parables. Uh, to understand them correctly, you have to recognize that they're not meant to be taken literally. Uh, in the parables, Jesus uses metaphorical language to communicate certain spiritual truths. He's not trying to teach us history lessons. Uh, the main point of the parable of the prodigal son is that God is always willing to take us back and forgive us no matter what we've done. The point is not that there was a specific Jewish father who lived in a certain village in a certain year and that he literally had a son who went off and did all the things the prodigal does in the parable and then came back. So if you want to understand the parable of the prodigal son correctly, you need to first figure out that it is a parable, a story using metaphorical language, and then you need to figure out what point is being expressed by the metaphor. So you shouldn't be distracted by all of the details used to make the story vivid and memorable, as if you had to give each one of them a concrete meaning. Right. Uh, at one point, the prodigal son is working as a swineherd, and he's starving and would really like to eat the carob pods that he's feeding to the pigs, but nobody gives him any to eat. The correct way to understand these details is that they combine to convey the impression of how degrading and desperate the son's situation is. It's desperate because he's starving and can't even eat any of the food he's giving the pigs, and it's degrading because as a Jew he wouldn't want to do the undignified task of feeding unclean animals like pigs. The point is that he's in a desperate and degrading situation because of his sinful life choices it would miss the point to say that we have to find some special symbolic meaning to like, what do these carob pods mean? Or, you know, they, they've got to be something specific. And it would miss the point even more to suppose that Jesus is talking about a specific Jewish man. I mean, let's call the prodigal son Zeke, for example, who really was reduced to feeding carob pods to pigs while starving himself. That's not Jesus's point. Instead, once we've identified a text that is largely metaphorical, we shouldn't overtax the details and make them mean more than they actually do. In a metaphorical narrative like a parable, the details may have specific meanings, or they may just be there to make the story vivid and memorable and to convey an overall impression that assists the message of the narrative. If a narrative contains metaphorical elements, does that mean it doesn't contain anything historical? No, there are different types of narratives, and they can contain greater or lesser amounts of metaphor. Uh, that's indicated by what Pius XII has already said, that although these chapters do contain metaphor, they also pertain to history in a true sense. But scholars need to study to figure out this how this form of writing works so that they can tell 
which elements are historical and which should be taken metaphorically. Has the Church ruled on that question for the flood narrative? Unfortunately, no. The Church hasn't really addressed mo of the early chapters of Genesis, but it has, at least not in specific terms, but it has given us some clarification on the first three chapters, which deal with the creation and fall of man. And it's been willing to recognize a good bit of symbolic language in these passages. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, God himself created the visible world in all its richness, diversity, and order. Scripture presents the work of the Creator symbolically, as a succession of six days of divine work, concluded by the rest of the seventh day. So the six days of creation in Genesis 1 aren't literal, but are a symbol of the work of the Creator, the fact that God really did make all things in heaven and earth. So because that's a symbolic sequence of days, don't press the details about what was created on day one or day two or day three and so on. It's the overall message that God created everything that the text is trying to convey, not the specific chronology of how this happened. Similarly, the Catechism says, How to read the account of the fall. The account of the fall in Genesis 3 uses figurative language, but affirms a primeval event, a deed that took place at the beginning of the history of man. Revelation gives us the certainty of faith that the whole of human history is marked by the original fault freely committed by our first parents. So Genesis 3 uses figurative language to tell us about an event at the beginning of human history where our first parents somehow fell into sin. Uh, some time ago, I did a study of magisterial texts about texts in early Genesis, and I documented quite a number of examples of places where popes have been willing to say that elements in early Genesis are symbols. We may talk about those findings in a future episode, but for now, suffice it to say that the Church allows a great deal of flexibility here. So while the Church hasn't ruled directly on the flood narrative of Genesis 6 to 9, it has acknowledged that this range of chapters includes passages that can, can contain a high degree of symbolism, like Genesis 1 and the days of the creation narrative that it describes. What implications does that have for how we are allowed to read the flood narrative? I think the magisterium, that is the church's teaching authority, is giving scholars a lot of liberty in how they understand this text. Uh, yes, it pertains to history in a sense, but it may use symbolic language to teach us truths that are primarily theological rather than historical or scientific. After all, that's the position the Church takes on the creation narrative found in Genesis 1. It pertains to history in a true sense. Uh, there was a creation of the world and a process by which the world came into its present form. But the lessons that Genesis 1 teaches us using symbolism are primarily theological rather than scientific or historical. The main point, and John Paul II was even specific on this at one point, the main point that the author of Genesis is trying to teach us in Genesis 1 is that God created all this stuff. Uh, if that's true of the creation narrative, it could also be true of the flood narrative. Does that mean we should take the flood narrative in such a general sense? No, we haven't even begun to look at the details of the flood narrative to determine how they should be understood. It could turn out that the flood narrative is highly literal, or it could turn out that it's highly symbolic, or it could turn out that it's somewhere in the middle. We can't prejudge the question because, as Pius XII stated, the way in which these chapters are written needs to be further studied so that we can properly understand what they are and what they're trying to teach us. What if a person thinks that the flood narrative is fully literal? If that's where he thinks the evidence points, great. I have no problem with that. Uh, since the Church hasn't ruled on the interpretation of these chapters one way or the other, nobody should be accused of being a bad Catholic, regardless of the conclusions they come to and which way they think the evidence points. Uh, I'm sure that not everybody in the audience will agree with the conclusions that I come to, and that's fine. You may think the text is more literal, than what I end up concluding. You may think it's less literal than what I end up concluding, or you may end up agreeing with me. But the Church regards all of us as good Catholics as long as we recognize that the text is divinely inspired, 
that it is teaching us the truth, regardless of how literal or symbolic it is being as it does that. And since the Magisterium may give us further clarification on this text in the future, none of us should be too wedded to our personal conclusions. We all need to be willing to heed what judgments the Magisterium may give in the future. Let's look at particular aspects of the text then. What about the idea that there was a worldwide flood? Does the text require that? Or could it mean something else, such as a local flood? Genesis contains statements that at least sound like they're describing a global flood. For example, uh, Genesis 6, chap uh, chapter 6, verses 12 and 13 say, And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So God says he's going to destroy the earth with a flood, and this will put an end to all flesh. Then in Genesis 6:19, he says, And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark, to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. So Noah is to bring two of every sort of animal with him at face value, that would mean every kind of animal life there is, at least of the land animals and birds. Then in Genesis 7 verses 19 and 20, it says, And the waters prevailed so mightily upon the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them fifteen cubits deep. So the flood was deep enough to cover all the high mountains under the whole heaven, all the whole sky, up to a depth of 15 cubits, or about 23 feet. Add that all up, and it at least sounds like a global flood. Before we look at whether the text can be taken other ways, I want to ask about how this is read from a young Earth perspective. If Noah was alive at the time the dinosaurs were, and Noah was told to take two of all the animals on board, why don't we have dinosaurs today? That would be really cool. It would be really cool and terrifying. <laughs> uh, but younger supporters can deal with this issue in more than one way. Uh, first, they might hold that when God tells Noah to take on board two of every creature, the biblical author is only intending to convey that Noah took two of every creature that we still have. In other words, God didn't tell Noah to take on board tyrannosaurs and brontosaurs and other dinosaurs. What the text is fundamentally trying to do on this view is tell the readers how the animals that we have now survived the flood. On this theory, it's not trying to tell us about animals that perished in the flood. On the other hand, some Young Earth supporters do believe that Noah took dinosaurs on the ark. If you go to Ken Ham's Ark Encounter theme park in Kentucky, uh, where they have a full-scale replica of the ark, they do have dinosaurs on board. How could Noah have possibly fit such huge creatures on the ark? And how could he feed them? Wouldn't they kill each other? Or kill the other animals? Or kill Noah and his family? One of the things that's been proposed is that they didn't take full-grown dinosaurs. They may have taken really young and thus really small juvenile specimens or even just eggs. Uh, taking small hatchlings or eggs would help also solve the problem of feeding them during the year they spent on the ark. And it would help keep them from being a danger to Noah's family or the other animals. But there's another possibility. One of the things that God says in Genesis 6.20 is this. Of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. So God says that two of every animal shall come into you to keep them alive. That means God himself will cause the animals to come to Noah so they can survive. Noah won't have to do a worldwide series of animal capturing expeditions. He's not going to go on this global safari. Uh, instead, God will do a miracle that will bring the animals to Noah to allow their survival. So 
God is doing a miracle of animal conservation, and if he does that to get them into the ark, there's no reason to think he'll let them go wild once they're in the ark. Uh, if he exerts his control to make them come to Noah, you'd expect him to keep them under control while they're in the ark so the dinosaurs uh, won't attack each other or the family. The purpose, after all, is to keep all these species alive through the flood. So if God caused the animals to tranquilly come to the ark, he can keep them tranquilized in the ark. And the same thing applies not just to dangerous dinosaurs, but to dangerous predators of all kinds, including lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thus think that young Earth supporters have at least a decent theoretical framework for how these creatures could have been taken and kept aboard the Ark. So what do they think happened to the dinosaurs? The young Earthers who hold that dinosaurs were on the Ark believe that they survived for some time afterwards. Uh, this would explain those sites where they think they found human footprints alongside dinosaur footprints, like at Paluxy Creek in Texas. Uh, on this view, these sites, or many of them, would have been laid down after the flood rather than before it, since the flood was a very destructive event that would have overturned and destroyed pre-flood track layers. Uh, but eventually, the dinosaurs went extinct. Uh, just on this view, it was after the flood rather than during it. Is there another interpretation of the places where Young Earth supporters claim we have dinosaur footprints alongside human ones? Yes, older supporters, whether they're religious or not, have pointed out that these footprints aren't very exact. Uh, they're pretty fuzzy, distorted impressions that were left in mud and stuff. It's not like we have crystal clear casts of feet that are undeniably human. In fact, as we'll talk about next episode, there are a bunch of problems with the claim that humans made the supposed Paluxy Creek footprints, and we'll have a link to where you can read about that. However, I don't want to spend too much time on the Young Earth Hypothesis. We already looked at it in episodes 119 through 120, and I invite listeners to go back and check out those episodes for more detail on the view and the difficulties with it. Okay, so if Genesis uses language that sounds like it's talking about a global flood, can the text be taken other ways? Some have proposed that the text is only describing a local flood, and to support this, they can appeal to the difference between what we know today and what was known when Genesis was written. For example, today we know that the Earth is a planet, in our case a spinning ball of rock and metal, as opposed to like a gas giant or something. Uh, but we don't have evidence that this was known by the Hebrews when the flood narrative originated sometime before 1000 BC. The ancient Greeks figured it out some centuries afterwards, and it was known in Jesus' day, but it was not known by the original audience of the flood narrative. They apparently did not conceive of the earth as a sphere. And if you'd like to hear what we had to say about the Bible and the flat earth theory, uh, you can go back and listen to episode 68. The key fact for our presentation is that the Hebrew term translated earth in these texts in the flood narrative is eretz, which just means ground or land. It doesn't imply what we would think of as a planet. As a result, advocates of a local flood argue that Genesis is just saying that the waters covered the ground or the land, meaning the ground that the ancient, in the ancient Near East where the story is set. What about the language suggesting that all mankind died, or that all the animals outside the ark died, or that all the mountains were covered? They would naturally interpret these things as being all the ones in the area. All the people in the area died, all the animals in the area died, and all the mountains in the area were covered. After all, uh, advocates of this view would say, look, people in the ancient Near East didn't know about other parts of the world. They didn't know about the Americas, where millions of people were living. They didn't know about animals living in other parts of the world, like jaguars in the Americas or kangaroos in Australia. And they didn't know about distant high mountains, like Mount Everest on the China-Nepal border. The text of Genesis is speaking from the perspective of a person living in the ancient Near East, and it's assuming the background knowledge that an ancient Near Eastern audience had. It's not assuming things that neither the audience nor his 
that neither the author nor his audience knew about. As a result, there's a case to be made that the flood narrative is only talking about a local flood that occurred in the ancient Near East, and thus there's an argument that it would overtax the text or press its wording beyond what either its author or audience would have known to suppose a global flood. Given what was known at the time that the flood narrative was written, an author would have written the account the way he did if it was a global flood, and he would have written it exactly the same way if it was a local flood. Therefore, the way the text is written doesn't allow us to distinguish between these two options, because a global flood and a local flood would have been described exactly the same way by an ancient Near Eastern author. He would have said, yeah, here in the ancient Near East, which is all I know about, everything got flooded. As a result, I think that the text allows for a local flood interpretation. We've considered the idea of a global flood, which would be could be conceived of as the most literal interpretation. And we've considered the idea of a local flood, which could be considered as a moderate position. Is there a position that would take the text even more symbolically or metaphorically? If I put my mind to it, I think there is. Uh, if you think about the story in its most general terms and the spiritual lessons that it contains, they go something like this. Disaster occurs because of human sin, and God will not allow unrepented human sin to go unpunished indefinitely. However, God will preserve the righteous through disasters. God also cares for his creation, including both humans and animals, and will not allow them to be utterly destroyed. But instead, when disaster occurs because of sin, God will always preserve a remnant and use it to build a new and better world. So I could imagine a person saying that things like that are the actual lessons that the flood narrative is meaning to teach us. The rest would be details to make the account vivid and memorable and spiritually impactful. Thus, this view would hold that we shouldn't focus on the fact that the narrative says the rain fell for 40 days any more than we should focus on the fact that the prodigal son was slopping pigs with carob pods. Uh, these would be supporting details to flesh out the narrative and make it vivid. And since there were many flood stories in the ancient Near East, and since big floods really did occur, the biblical author uses this as the setting for his narrative, the same way Jesus often used first century Palestine as the setting for his parables. So it draws inspiration, so to speak, from actual historical things. You know, Jesus based his parables on farmers and kings and fathers and, you know, in a first century Palestinian setting to teach a spiritual lesson. And so uh, you could say, well, even though there was no specific flood behind the Great Flood, there were floods, and the author of Genesis drew inspiration from that and used it to teach us these spiritual lessons about God's providence. So other ancient Near Eastern cultures did also have flood narratives. Could the biblical author have been correcting pagan ideas about the Great Flood by writing what he did? Yeah, and as we'll see under the reason perspective, some of the ancient Near Eastern flood stories attributed the flood to things other than human sin. Uh, for example, some of the Babylonian narratives say that the gods sent the flood because humans were making too much noise at night and keeping the gods awake, and they didn't realize the consequences that the flood would have. Uh, this depicts the gods as being unjust and foolish. By, as we'll mention next time, I mean, they're going crazy once they unleash the flood and they're terrified of what they've done. Uh, by contrast, the author of Genesis would be correcting these ideas by showing that God only sent uh, the flood because of human sin and that he preserved the righteous to build a better world. The author would be showing us truths that God is just and wise and merciful as opposed to these foolish gods that unleashed a flood they couldn't even control. The author would thus be intending us to learn theological truths about God rather than historical lessons, as in Genesis 1 on this view. Now, this is a highly metaphorical interpretation of the flood narrative, and I'm not saying that this is the true interpretation. I'm just saying I can imagine someone interpreting the text this way. 
We thus have a range of options between the most literal global flood option, uh, the middle local flood option, and the least literal primarily theological interpretation of the flood. What about the figure of Noah himself? Does the Bible require us to regard him as a historical person? The starting assumption is that he should be regarded as a historical person. This is the case with the vast majority of the people mentioned in the Bible. However, we have to be sensitive to the context in which a person is mentioned. If a person is mentioned in the context of a parable, well, we shouldn't make the assumption he was historical. Thus, if it turned out that the flood narrative was an extended parable, like in the primarily theological interpretation, we shouldn't make this assumption about Noah. In that case, uh, he wouldn't be a historical figure any more than Jesus' prodigal son would be a historical figure. So we really have to determine the genre of the flood narrative, the degree to which it's historical or metaphorical, in order to answer the question of whether Noah should be read as historical or not. What about the re references to Noah later in the Bible? Do they demand that he be a literal figure? Not necessarily. It depends on the point that the text is trying to make. And here a comparison might prove useful. Suppose in the course of a Mysterious World episode, we're looking at the options for what might explain a mystery. And at some point I say, well, as Sherlock Holmes taught us, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. If I say something like that, and I've said it before on the show, have I just asserted that Sherlock Holmes was a real historical individual? I mean, you might suppose that I did because I referred to Sherlock Holmes teaching us something, but, and, and you know, teaching is something that only living human beings can do. You might suppose that if I am to be taken literally. But I'm not to be taken literally, because we all know Sherlock Holmes is a fictional character. And what I'm referring to is a principle that the fictional character articulated in the stories about him, the process of elimination principle. What I'm really asserting in my, state, in my statement is not that Sherlock Holmes was a real person. Instead, I'm asserting that we need to use a particular principle when we're evaluating possible explanations for mysteries. That is, if we eliminate all the impossible ones, we need to accept what remains, even if it sounds improbable. That's the real point I'm making. In the same way, we need to ask what the point is that later biblical authors are making when they refer to Noah, whether they're making the point that Noah existed or whether they're just trying to make a different point. For example, Here's what Jesus says about Noah in the Gospels. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And that's the point. The point Jesus is making here is that the coming of the Son of Man will be sudden and unexpected. People will be carrying on with their lives as normal, and then sudden disaster will occur. Jesus compares the coming of the Son of Man to the days of Noah, because it's a familiar literary comparison that people will know about. They know the story of Noah. But his point is not to teach us about Noah. It's to teach us about the coming of the Son of Man. And if he's not trying to teach us about Noah, that means we can't press the details of the passage to show that Noah was a historical individual. If Jesus knew that the flood narrative was figurative, he could have referred to Noah in exactly the same way, just like I referred to Sherlock Holmes in making my point about the process of elimination. Can you give a modern example of that to make the point clear? Sure. Uh, today, H.G. Wells's story, The War of the Worlds, is familiar to many people. In it, Earth is suddenly invaded by Martians at the end of the 19th century, and the people of Earth totally did not expect the attack. Here's how Orson Welles' 1938 War of the Worlds radio broadcast began. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, 
This world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. Yet across an immense ethereal gulf, minds that are to our minds as ours are to the beasts in the jungle, intellects vast, cool, and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. Now, with that as background, I could predict some future disaster and say, just like in War of the Worlds, people were going about their daily business, doing all their usual tasks, when the unexpected disaster will strike. But I wouldn't be implying that War of the Worlds really happened. I know that it didn't, but that doesn't stop me from using it when it's an apt comparison. In the same way, if Jesus knew that the Noah narrative was figurative, that wouldn't stop him from using it when it made an apt comparison. So I don't think that Jesus' reference to Noah settles the matter one way or the other. It could be that Noah was a historical individual and Jesus knew that and referred to him as such, but the text also has the flexibility to allow Jesus to refer to Noah even if Jesus knew that the text was figurative. And I think the same thing applies to the other passages in the New Testament where Noah gets mentioned. There aren't very many of them, but if you study them carefully, you find out that in each case, the biblical author isn't trying to teach us about Noah. He's trying to teach us about something else, and he's using Noah to make that point. So those texts also contain this flexibility. We mentioned that between the idea of a global flood and a purely figurative flood, there is a middle idea of a local flood. Is there a similar middle option when it comes to Noah? I think so. The middle option would be that there was a real historical individual, uh, even though we shouldn't press all the details about him in the flood narrative. Uh, this seems to be the natural conclusion if it turns out the local flood interpretation is true. In that case, the flood narrative would be based on traditions coming from a survivor of that local flood disaster, and the survivor himself would be the historical Noah, even if he wasn't called Noah. And thus there would be a real historical figure corresponding to Noah, even if we shouldn't press all the details of the narrative, like the idea that his name was literally Noah. Why should we be cautious about pressing details like that? Because we'd be dealing with a mixed text, where some of the details are historical and some are supplied to fill in the details and make it an effective story. It's like in the Gospels. Uh, when someone comes to Jesus and asks him to perform a miracle and they have a conversation, there were no tape recorders in the ancient world, so the details of the conversation are not meant to be pressed. Uh, they're not meant to be exact word-for-word -word quotations of, you know, what someone said, please heal my daughter or whatever. Uh, you can even see that by comparing one gospel to another and noticing how the words in the conversation are quoted a little differently by the different evangelists. The words are only meant to express the gist of the conversation and not be an exact transcript. So the evangelists have supplied an approximation of what the person said, but we're not meant to press that approximation. The important thing, the thing that the evangelist is asserting, is that Jesus did a miracle for this person, not the specific words that were used when the person asked him to do so. In the same way, the author of Genesis may have been giving us the gist of a real historical incident, but also supplying certain details to give us an effective telling of what happened with the understanding, okay, I'm giving you the gist, but I'm describing it with these details that you shouldn't press. And that could apply to Noah's name? Yes, because one of the things you discover when you study the Bible closely is that it sometimes refers to people by names they didn't have during their lifetimes. Uh, for example, King Saul had a son named Ishbaal, 
And he's referred to by that name in the genealogy at the beginning of the Book of Chronicles, or the two books it was later split in two. Ishbaal means man of Baal, the god Baal. So he's like, you've just named your kid after Baal, the god. Well, Baal, being the name of a pagan god, was something that not all of the biblical authors liked to write. And as a result, they sometimes replaced the word Baal with the similar sounding word Bosheth, which means shame, because the worship of Baal was a shameful thing. Consequently, the author of Samuel doesn't refer to Saul's son as Ish Baal, or man of Baal. Instead, he refers to him as Ish Bosheth, or man of shame, because he has the shameful name of a pagan god. The author of Samuel thus gives this name to a historical figure that the historical figure wasn't actually called by during his own lifetime. Uh, the biblical authors thus sometimes do refer to historical individuals by new names. Another example of that, it very likely, is the first man, Adam, who has the Hebrew name Adam. Well, in Hebrew, Adam means man or mankind, but Hebrew is not the world's oldest language. So what we have here is the biblical author is giving the first man, the first member of mankind, a Hebrew name that means man or mankind, but this isn't what the first man would have been called in his own day, but it's a good name to use for him later on once the Hebrew language developed. Is there evidence that Noah's name would have been a new name applied to a historical individual? Yes, because Noah, the name, has a special meaning too. In Genesis 5, at the end of Genesis 5, we read, When Noah's father Lamech had lived 182 years, he became the father of a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground which the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the toil of our hands. The prodigious age of Lamech, at which Lamech had Noah, 182, is one sign that the details of this text may not be literal, but another is the name Noah itself. It's not obvious to us English speakers, but the Hebrew name Noah sounds like the Hebrew word that means rest. So Noah has a symbolic name connected with the idea of rest because, as the text says, he will bring us relief from the work and from the toil of our hands. Uh, that harks back to Genesis 3, where God cursed the ground because of Adam's sin resulting in difficult labor. Uh, this is a matter that biblical scholars have discussed, but one way or another, Noah was supposed to relieve the hard labor caused by the curse on the ground, and thus he brought rest. Noah thus has at least a partly symbolic name, like Adam, which is a sign that we shouldn't press the detail literally, as if he had to be called this during his lifetime. It may well be that this is one of those after-the-fact names that biblical authors sometimes give to earlier individuals, sometimes for symbolic reasons. Now, what about the discussion of rainbows after the flood ends? Does that passage require us to say that rainbows never happened before this point in history? I don't think so. Here's what the text actually says. After the flood is over, God makes a covenant not to destroy the world or the land uh, by another flood. And we read, God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will look upon it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. So what's the central point that the text is trying to teach us? 
it seems to me that the central point is that God has made a solemn promise not to destroy the land by a flood in the future. That's the main thing the text is doing. It's assuring the biblical reader that they and their descendants don't have to worry that everyone's going to be killed by a flood. To illustrate the seriousness of the problem, the text describes it as a covenant or solemn sacred contract that God has made. But when humans make solemn covenant promises uh, between each other, they sometimes forget what the promises are and go against them. Uh, As a result, human covenants sometimes had visible signs associated with them, such as stones that would be set up or piled up as a reminder to remind the parties of what they had promised. These reminders served as guarantees that the covenant would be honored rather than forgotten. But God is omniscient and doesn't need a reminder of what he's promised, so why would he need a rainbow to remind him not to destroy everyone with a future flood? He wouldn't. Uh, The fact that the text says, when the bow is in the clouds, I will look upon it and remember, is a sign that that part of the text is figurative. As a result, uh, God doesn't really need a reminder of what he promised, and so it isn't a sign for God. The rainbow isn't a sign for God, not literally. It's a sign for us. Uh, Whenever we see the rainbow, which often appears in the sky when it rains and we might start worrying about a flood, we can be assured that it will not result in the end of everybody. This is a sign for us, not God. Uh, The fact that God doesn't literally need this reminder is thus a signal that the text is not meant to be taken fully literally. And the text doesn't even say that rainbows had never happened before. It simply indicates that, going forward, the rainbow will have this significance. In fact, pre-modern authors recognized that the text wasn't saying that the rainbow had never appeared previously. For example, the medieval Jewish commentator Moses Maimonides recognized that the rainbow had appeared previously, but now it was given a new symbolic significance. So although there had been earlier rainbows, now the rainbow meant that God wouldn't destroy mankind with a future flood. And if you'd like to read more about that, you could check out the Jewish Publication Society Genesis Torah Commentary by Nahum Sarna at uh, Genesis 9.13, if you want to look up the particular passage. So the text about the rainbow can be taken different ways, and we don't have conclusive proof one way or the other from the text whether rainbows appeared before. Ultimately, uh, the church has not weighed in definitively on any of the options we've covered, so from the faith perspective, they are in principle open and people may choose among them based on how they see the evidence and what they think it supports. So, Jimmy, what is your preliminary bottom line about Noah and the Flood? From uh, the faith perspective, we have a range of options. At one end of the spectrum, the text would allow us to hold a global flood in which every detail of the text is taken fully literally, including a historical Noah with every detail of his life being exact, including his name. At the other end of the spectrum, people could hold a theological interpretation of the text that teaches doctrinal lessons without requiring a historical flood, and on that view, Noah would not be a historical figure, but like one of the figures in Jesus' parables who's there to illustrate certain lessons. In the middle, we have the possibility that there was a local flood, according to which some of the details in the text should be taken literally, but others should not be pressed. Uh, This includes details of the life of the patriarch Noah, who would have been a real historical person, even if some of the details of his life as it's described in the text were supplied. The church hasn't ruled definitively on any of these positions, so the, the faith perspective permits each of these views, at least in principle. So we can't say which among them is most likely until we take a look at the evidence from the reason perspective. And I want to close by pointing out that at this point, I'm not endorsing any of these perspectives. I'm not even commenting on which ones I think are more or less likely. I'm just saying right now, none of them have been completely ruled out. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listener and viewer on what we've been talking about? Uh, 
We'll have a link to a book by Trimper Longman and John Walton called The Lost What The Lost World of the Flood: Mythology, Theology, and the Deluge Debate. Uh, that is one that's going to argue for a. If I if I fully grasp their thesis, it's basically a local flood. They certainly. Uh, don't believe that there is a global flood, but they uh, have a very interesting discussion of the flood narrative in light among other, of, among other things, ancient Near Eastern literature. Also, we'll have a link to David Montgomery's book, The Rocks Don't Lie, A Geologist Investigates Noah's Flood. Uh, Jerry Blount's book, Noah and the Great Flood, Proof and Effects. That one is a uh, pro-global flood book, so you'll get different perspectives from these books. We'll also have a link to a page from Answers in Genesis's website where they offer six major evidences for the uh, for a global flood, and we'll be talking about those evidences next episode. We'll have a link to Pius XII's encyclical Humanae Generis that we talked about earlier, a link to Ken Ham's Ark Encounter theme park, a link to an article on the Paluxy uh, River footprints, and so people should have quite a number of things to keep them busy until next week when we cover the reason perspective. Excellent. So let's move on to our mysterious feedback. As I mentioned earlier, we're, we're going to have feedback on our recent episode on the Border Patrol ghost. And our first feedback comes from Joseph, who sent an email. The detail of this story that most jumped out at me was the appearance of Luis Santiago carrying his own head. I couldn't help but think of St. James, Santiago, the Greater, who was beheaded under King Herod Agrippa. Despite the nature of his martyrdom, I can't find any examples of Santiago depicted in religious art of iconography as an autocephalophore, a saint who carries their own head, like St. Denis. But St. James has a strong connection to popular piety in the Spanish-speaking world and is at the heart of many popular legends, such as his being the Matamors in the Middle Ages. We know that popular piety and simple folklore often results in these sorts of conflations of figures, and so I couldn't help wondering if the vision of Luis Santiago carrying his own head wasn't connected in some way to some popular superstition or pious legend, given the connection of the man's last name. I'd be fascinated to hear Jimmy's thoughts. Well, it's uh, it, it's certainly interesting that uh, it was reported that the ghost of Luis Santiago appeared carrying his own head. Agent Santiago's head was not actually torn off. He wasn't decapitated when he fell off the cliff, but his neck was broken. And so there is a connection there, but it's not fully off. And so he wouldn't have been able to carry it if this were physical. And so it's possible since the manifestation of the ghost goes farther than what physically happened to Agent Santiago, that it could be connected uh, with... uh, with uh, St. James, son of Zebedee, um, who is incidentally never called St. James the Greater in the Bible, even though he's sometimes referred to that way in common speech. Um, James, son of Zebedee, was beheaded by Herod Agrippa I um, in the Passover of AD 42. 243, actually, if I recall correctly. And uh, and so it's possible that uh, that could be influencing the way the ghost was perceived. Also, uh, Joseph mentions uh, St. James being referred to as Matamor or Matamoros. Um, that's Spanish, basically, for Moor Slayer. Uh, there were legends in the during the Reconquista, uh, when uh, Christians were reclaiming Spain after it had been occupied by Muslims, uh, where the Moors, who were Muslims that had come over from North Africa, uh, were defeated in battle by St. James, and there are even legends of St. James appearing himself in battle and participating and slaying Moors, and so he become, became known as Matamoros, the slayer of Moors. Daniel Tucker sent an email, and he wrote, I just listened to yesterday's episode on Luis Santiago, the Border Patrol ghost. I think this is my new second favorite episode, second only to number 115, Wizard Clip. I particularly love the way that you tie these ghost story episodes into our Catholic theology of death and the afterlife, the survival of the soul beyond bodily death, purgatory, Aquinas' views on souls appearing to the living, etc., 
every time I hear from Daniel Tucker, I cannot escape the earworm of the folk song. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's it's a it's a great nineteenth century folk song. Folk song. Old Dan Tucker was a mighty man. Washed his face in a frying pan. Combed his hair with a wagon wheel, and he died with a toothache in his heel. Now get out the way, Old Dan Tucker. You're too late to get your supper. Supper's over and dinner's cooking. Old Dan Tucker, just stand there looking. And it goes on, but it's a great song and I love it. And so I always love it when I hear from Daniel Tucker because I think of that. Um, in terms, I'm so glad, uh, Daniel, that you enjoy uh, the ghost stories. Uh, they do indeed have a strong faith connection. Um, and originally, in the early days in Mysterious World, we didn't have them. I mean, episode one was about ghosts, so I could talk the theory of ghosts at the time, but I hadn't read a lot of ghost lore and I didn't want to uh, just be covering, you know, the kinds of things you see on Ghost Hunter TV shows where, okay, there are people who said something's going on here, but there's it just there's not much to it unless you really hype it and exaggerate it. And that's not what Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is about. So it took a while for me to start learning the ghost lore enough to be able to identify things like the Border Patrol ghost and Wizard Clip and Greenbrier ghost that we did last week. And I'm trying to only give ghost stories that are that have something significant about them beyond we went into this house and we heard moaning or bumping or something like that. So I'm trying to give you the ghost stories that there's actually something to talk about. And uh and hopefully uh, there should be a considerable number of these in the future because actually I've been boning up on um, on modern parapsychological investigations of ghosts and hauntings and poltergeists and apparitions. Uh, in fact, uh, this fall I'm taking a couple of courses from the Rhine Institute uh, founded by J.B. Rhine um, as I'm taking a couple of their paranormal investigations courses. So uh, it should we should have some interesting stories going forward. Mm. Actually, by the end of those, assuming I pass, which I expect to, but assuming I pass, I will be technically certified or qualified to be certified as a as a as a paranormal investigator, ghost hunter. Jimmy, if you and I ever like take a video of us spending the, the night in a haunted house, I mean that would be gold. I think I think it would be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> If anything happens, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to make, I'm not going to fake ghost phenomena or walk around with an e-meter claiming it's, oh, this is real evidence when it's not. And swing the camera like, did you see that? And there's nothing there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Our next uh, feedback comes from Paul on Patreon who wrote, a ghost story with a robot worked in. What a combo. Great show. The kids loved it. It was creepy at night, but not in the day. We need to listen to it in the day, said my daughter. So kudos on Scare Factor. I do like the radio play-like effects you've added to the recent shows, the CB chatter, etc. Nice touch. Thank you. Uh, it's been an ongoing journey figuring out the best way to do audio storytelling. Um, a while back, we ex originally we didn't have any effects in the show, and then we started introducing them, and we kind of experimented with them, and let ourselves go a little crazy and then pull them back a bit. And I think we found a nice balance now. When they're relevant to the story, uh, we do them. And I thought Dom did a really good job with the radio effects in Border Patrol Ghost. Um, we could have done similar things in the 9-11 uh, episode where some of the stuff was read by me and Dom and Melanie. But I didn't want to do it in 9-11 because we were also using real recordings from people who were on the planes, including the hijackers on 9-11. And I wanted it to be absolutely clear to the, um, to the listeners which recordings were real and from the day versus which were reconstructions by Dom and Melanie and me. Yes. Uh, C.R. Nugent also wrote on Patreon, a theory, the coyote had a gun shot at the ghost when the ghosts laughed, they ran in terror. They never found the gun because it went over the cliff, too. Well, it's possible. Um, we don't really know what the interaction was between uh, the ghost and the coyote. Um, that's a possibility. It could have been something else. Uh, 
it's also possible the uh, coyote just saw the ghost and freaked out and fell over the cliff without any further interaction. Uh, Sarah sent an email. She said, uh, my brother told me about your podcast. I've been driving back and forth between Arizona and L.A., California. It's been interesting listening to the stories. I do realize that it is basically a Catholic broadcast. I would love to provide feedback from my perspective. I was raised a Catholic, and I became an atheist at age 16. I became a repentant believer in Jesus Christ at age 26. I did notice in response to the Border Patrol agent Santiago that you did say from a faith perspective that he was probably in purgatory and had to work out God's directive to him to basically avenge his own death as a ghost. I was very sad to hear that because the teaching of purgatory is not in the Word of God, it is only in Catholic teaching. As I continue to listen, I do suggest and pray that you will give commensurate authority to both the Word of God and to the teaching of the Church. In this instance, the teachings collided as it is stated that once a man dies, he faces the judgment. I can find no biblical basis for the Church's, church's teaching on purgatory. Thank you very much for writing, Sarah. Uh, we're glad to have you as a new listener. We're glad you're enjoying the show. And I'm very glad that you've recovered your Christian faith. That's awesome. Um, in terms of the Church's teaching on purgatory, well, uh, I'm a Catholic apologist, and I've talked uh, about purgatory extensively over the years. I would actually say there is a biblical basis. Um, what purgatory is, essentially, is the final purification that makes us ready to be with God in heaven, because we're still sinful in this life. We still have temptations and disordered desires, but that's not going to be the case in heaven. We're not going to be sinning in heaven. We're not going to be tempted to sin in heaven. We're going to be confirmed in love and holiness in God's presence. And so if we are still suffering from these disordered desires or temptations in this life that can lead us to sin, and we're not going to be having that in heaven, then between death and heaven, we must be purified and the, of those desires. And the Church simply refers to that purification as purgatory. And it's another way of thinking of it, uh, in evangelical terms, because sanctification is understood to be the process by which God's grace leads us to grow in holiness, purgatory is simply the final stage of our sanctification. And there are specific passages in Scripture that uh, talk about this, in addition to the principles that I just mentioned, which are also based in Scripture. One of them is not in the Protestant Bible. It's in the Bible that's used by other Christians, Catholics, Orthodox, other Eastern Christians, basically everybody except Protestants, have a book in their Bible called Second Maccabees. And in Second Maccabees, it has a passage where it establishes that it is a noble thing to pray for those who have fallen asleep in righteousness, but nevertheless have some continuing effects from their sin that they need to be freed from. And like I said, this this book is not in the Protestant Bible, but it, it was in everybody else's Bible at the time of the Reformation. And Protestants took it out principally because they didn't like this teaching. So I would say, well, there's a biblical basis right there. But even if you say, well, okay, it's not in my Bible. I'm a Protestant. I don't have Second Maccabees in my Bible. It's also there in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul is talking about how uh, how our works are going to be judged by God, and he uses a building metaphor. He compare, he says, you know, based on the foundation of Jesus Christ, we do things in life that can be compared to building with noble substances like gold and precious gems, or common substances like wood and hay and straw. And he says, it doesn't matter how you build, our works are going to be tested by fire. And even, even for those who are saved, if, they're, uh, if they've built with just common materials, th like wood, hay, and straw, their works will be burned up, and they will be saved, but it will be like escaping through flames, like running out of a burning building. And that's not a fun thing to do, to be in a burning building and have to run out of it. But still, we're talking about the saved here. So there is an experience that is, even for the saved, after death, that's not 100% pleasant, but that is part of our transition to being in the full glory of heaven. And 
so this passage, I think, does provide a biblical basis for this purification that we talked about, as well as the general principles I talked about. Now, oftentimes people don't understand the church's teaching on purgatory. I would recommend you take a look, and we'll have a link to this in the further resources. I would uh, recommend you take a look at Pope Benedict XVI's encyclical Spe Salvi on Christian hope, especially uh, paragraphs 45 to 48. And like I said, we'll have a link to that. He has a, a very uh, good discussion of purgatory and how it's understood. He points out it doesn't necessarily take any time. You know, it could happen in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, uh, because, as he says, purgatory can't be measured in earthly time. Also, he points out that the the image of fire that's used has been understood by many theologians, and actually he's one of them. Uh, he doesn't really mention that, but he himself has proposed this as a theologian before he was pope, that the fire of purgatory is the love of Jesus Christ. And so when we encounter Jesus Christ, his love for us burns away our impurities and transforms us so that we're fully in his image and ready for heaven. So um, check out that. We'll also have a link to an article that I wrote about the uh, roots of the doctrine of purgatory, including its biblical basis, and how it's been understood by Christians all the way down through history, including in the second century. So please check that out. Thanks so much for listening, and we hope you keep listening and keep enjoying the show. Cameron writes on YouTube, I appreciate the relation to Revelation about how deceased souls cry out for vengeance. However, isn't the book of Revelation mainly metaphorical? How do we know that this passage is meant to be taken literally? Fantastic episode. I just had a hard time relating that to the reason why Luis might have been able to pursue his possible killer. It's certainly true that a lot of Revelation is meant to be taken uh, metaphorically or symbolically rather than literally, and that could include the cry of the souls under the altar in uh, Revelation for, uh, for justice against those who persecuted them on earth and put them to death. That, that could be non-literal, um, but it's still a mode that Scripture uses to convey some heavenly reality to us. And in the same way, um, I would look at a case like Santiago being able to pursue his killer in order to obtain justice um, as in a similar light. It, there's There may be something metaphorical happening here, but it still is a way that God may choose to allow our human minds to process what's really going on here, even if we shouldn't take it all literally. And so I would say that if Revelation uses this image, even if it's not literal, it still shows that God can use this type of of image, this cry for justice, as to represent some kind of spiritual reality that's actually happening. And a similar or the same spiritual reality could be happening with Agent Santiago and his interactions with his killer. Uh, Victor on YouTube writes, forget about spacemen and demons. I want to hear about ancient robots like Talos. Domo arigato, Mr. Roboto. Well, we will be getting to Talos and other ancient robots. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to read a great book, uh, check out uh, the book Gods and Robots. I'm blanking on the author's name, but um, I'll see if we can get a link to the book in the, uh, in the further resources. It's a great read. Rose writes on YouTube, uh, Regarding a soul in purgatory causing the death of a murderer, in this case, assuming the smuggler killed Santiago, it's not out of the question that the smuggler would go on to kill other agents. Perhaps the ghost was allowed to kill the smuggler in order to prevent further more murders. It's possible, though I would point out that we don't know that Santiago's ghost did kill the murderer. Um, we know that, I mean, we have evidence that this coyote was responsible for Santiago's death, and then he died after having seen Santiago's ghost. But that's not the same thing as saying Santiago killed him. And we didn't say that in the episode. In fact, I remember, you know, pointing out, we don't know what happened in this interaction. 
it and merely the fact the ghost was allowed to confront his killer is not the same and his killer died is not saying that the ghost killed his killer so um so even though that's a possibility it is not the only one here and it, like we said earlier in this episode's feedback it could be he just the killer saw him freaked out and fell over the cliff so just ghost confronts killer and killer dies does not equal ghost killed killer. So just to keep that in mind. Uh, James writes on YouTube, why would we question the Bible? If the Bible says it, I believe it. I wouldn't question whether or not it was a, it was possible for Job to be swallowed by a whale. If we start questioning things like this, then it leads to an open door. I ask these questions respectfully. If I misunderstood it, then please correct me. This is a very underrated series, and I enjoy it a lot. Thank you so much, James. We really appreciate it. Um, the believing, as I do, in the inspiration of the Bible, I don't question whether the Bible's true. Uh, the question is, what does the Bible mean in a particular passage? And sometimes it is um, not obvious to modern readers what something means. And so there can be questions about, like, was Jonah actually swallowed by a whale or is that, or a fish? And is the text trying to teach us something else? And, you know, this episode is an illustration of that. I hope it's clear uh, from our discussion of the Great Flood from the faith perspective. I'm not questioning that the Bible's teaching us truth here. The quest, as always, is to figure out what truths is it teaching? Are they simply theological, or does it go beyond that into historical and, uh, or scientific, or, you know, what? Um, and the answer is not the same in every kind of passage. If you're dealing with Jesus's parables, they're teaching spiritual truths rather than historical ones. But if you're in the Gospels and you step out of Jesus's parables and you're reading stories about Jesus, they are not only teaching spiritual truths, they're also teaching historical ones about Jesus. And so we have to be sensitive from one passage to another about what kind of literature is it and what kind of lessons is it trying to teach us. And that's the real quest. Thank you, everyone, for your feedback. We greatly appreciate it. Jimmy, what do we have for Mysterious Headlines this week? Well, we have a couple of headlines about the moon, because uh, the moon, as people know, affects our tides. And since this is a great flood episode, I thought it was worth pointing out the moon also affects flooding. Um, the moon wobbles on its axis, or on it, it, the moon's orbit around the Earth wobbles, and when it's in line with the Earth's equator, it increases flooding. And so this is a predictable cycle, and we may be having more floods in the 2030s as a result of the moon. So check out uh, this link on the effect that the moon has on flooding and similar aspects of our weather. Also, uh, it has been speculated for some time that our unusually large moon for the size of our planet. I mean, it's really big enough. It is, our moon is our sister planet. We live on a twin planet. Um, but uh, the fact we have this overly large moon or sister planet may have made life possible here on Earth. And there have been a variety of ways in which that's been proposed. We'll have a link to an article from Scientific American about one of them, about how the moon's effect on our tides on the early Earth may have helped life get its jump start. So uh, check that out. Uh, the moon uh, is a very has some very interesting potential effects on Earth. Excellent. Well, that'll do it from us. We do want to hear from you, your theories about the Great Flood and what the Faith Perspective has to say about it. You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world. So, Jimmy, what are we going to be talking about next time? Next week, we'll be looking at the Great Flood from the reason perspective and seeing what the scientific evidence has to say. Excellent. Folks, please share the podcast with your friends and write a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast from to help us grow our community and reach more listeners. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. 
And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>